Teddy, we're live. Uh-huh. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Bingo Day. Happy. Not Bingo Day. This is a regular cocktail night, my love. It's a regular cocktail night. Cheers, my dears. Happy Friday. Cheers. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Look who's with me. It's Teddy Beanzo. Am I allowed to say that? Yes. Teddy Beanzo. Let's see who's on. Time to switch the glasses already. As you can see, we have a set change. We are at Gami's house. <laughs> We're having a Gami's house adventure. Happy Friday, everybody. Teddy, play the game. Count how many wine glasses people put up for us, right? <laughs> okay, April, Welcome good to the evening. Game. Don't don't touch. No, no, do not touch the computer. You can't imagine how much trouble okay. we had with this machine in the last 15 minutes. Yeah, don't touch the computer okay. at all. Uh, three... Three wine glasses. So far, three. <laughs> April, good to see you. Happy Friday. Kaz, great yeah, to cool see now. you. Kaz, Kaz is on who sent you the beautiful carp kites. Thanks. Right? We took a night. Kaz, thank you so much. Kaz sent Teddy some beautiful things and Joss a beautiful uh, birthday present. Joss's birthday is coming up. I forgot to announce we're putting some of Joss's patterns that she made for her birthday, which is next Thursday. Just. Jo they can see you. You know that, right? I Just turns that. eight next Thursday. So her patterns are up on ribboncandyhooking.com. They're having a sale on them. And through this week, she's going to be adding some more. So be on the lookout for those. We're putting those together as kits. They're a bargain for beginners um, and friends who, who love to see Joss's work. She's come up with some be some beauties mm -hmm. lately. I, uh, um, bye, Mom. I was just going to make a cameo. So Oh, just a cameo. Are you going to love me and leave me? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, so don't make any noise. Um, Tara, happy Friday. Great to see you. Robin, Robin, Robin gave us three glasses, Ted. Cheers, my dears. Happy Friday. I feel like a barbarian. I'm drinking white, but it's so nice. Teresa, happy Friday. Cheers, my dears. Kirsten, cheers. Happy Friday. Great to see you. Kira, great to see you. Kira, Kirsten, let me know how often... Kirsten and Kira are two of my very close friends, very, very close friends. Um, and it's hard because they're both K's. And I have another good friend who hooks, who's also called K. The three K's, there's got to be something about that. It's got to be like the X-Men, the three K's. I've done a lot of confusion of the three K's. But I want to remind you that Kirsten has a, has a tab on ribbon candy hooking with the most tremendous um, designs. Cats, dogs, animals, all kinds of things. Is the skeleton out yet, Kirsten, for Halloween? Because that is a beauty. I'm going to start hooking some to put more of an emphasis on those designs because they are very different than mine, and they are so good. They are much better than my designs. They are super artistic. Um, Kira, great to see you. Kira and I have plans to go to King Richard's Fair soon, so I'm holding my breath for that. Uh, tuning in from the first archery tournament of the season. You are a good mom. You have got all kinds of stuff going on. Archery is such an old-timey hobby, isn't it? I didn't even realize. You used to do archery, right, Mom? In sure. school, you yeah, did archery. Yeah, Maid Marion over here. Maid Who Marian. knew, right? Yes, I don't know. I Robin Hood did archery, right? I don't know about Maid Marion, but we'll make the I leap. got a bullseye with a broken arrow. Don't you got a bullseye me. with a broken arrow? Yeah. You so got to you so got to write a memoir and that be the title. I, I got a bullseye with a broken arrow. It sounds like one of those expressions, even a broken clock is right twice, twice. a day. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you, Doreen. Happy Cheers, my dears. Hour or so. We'll see. I, I feel like I have a full episode tonight. I'm such a jerk. I felt like I had no episode, and now I feel like I have a huge episode, so I better start drinking and talking fast. Thank you, printer. <laughs> Thank you, printer. The printer called the Envy. It sounds like more of a perfume than a printer, Ooh. doesn't it? Yeah. Just gave us... I won't. I can't say the words money. that are in my head. A run for the money. Let's leave it at that, right? Karen, good to see you from the Jersey Shore. It was great seeing you yesterday. We had such a fun Zoom yesterday. Oh, I'm so I know not everybody so. can tune in and Zoom in the middle of the day on a Thursday. That's a decadent thought, isn't it? But it's a great opportunity to just be silly and talk off the cuff, and we don't record. Everybody just can say what they want, be what they want, do what they want, ask questions. And we just have fun. But it was a, it was a fun. Um, it was a fun time yesterday, and I really needed to blow off some steam, so it was great to connect with friends that way. Let's see. Barbara, good to see you. I've missed you the last couple of days. I'm happy to see that you're there. Teddy, you got a bunch of highs, my love. Oh, Chrissy, good to see you. Mom, do you want to come sit next to me? Oh, no. I'll sit over here. <laughs> That's a no. 
Patricia, I missed you too. I was hoping you were going to be on yesterday, but I'll see you soon. Oh, Wait, here he comes. Just, thank you for saying hi. Oh, you got a lot of highs then. Too. You got a lot of highs. Catherine is on from Idaho. Catherine, I have a direct question for you in the middle of the commentary tonight. So, oh, I forgot to bring my Atha up. I finally got Atha in the mail today. Is it down there? Um, it, it is in one of my bags. Yeah, it is in one of my bags. Are you or down there? I don't know. Not a great to see you. Happy Friday night. Look at all the buddies are on. Oh, Nada says, so good uh, good earth iced tea here. Very refreshing on the last day of 82 degrees. That's the prediction is it's going to be the last day uh, of 80, of that kind of heat, huh? It's been, it, you know, it's been warm too here. It was humid today. It rained like Martha was saying, like in uh, Canada, it was raining like uh, biblical rain. And she said she was going to build an ark for the Newfies, her her. Um, is litter the right word for um, dogs of Newfoundland puppies? But she said she was going to build an ark for them because there was so much rain. And uh, I think we got that rain today. Kirsten says the Day of the Dead doll is out. The dog is not soon. The dog with the frisbee, I think, is my favorite. i got to see that soon. Christine, hello in Watertown. You go into the old tattered flag tomorrow for their harvest fest. That sounds so oh, nice. good. They have a hooking tent. Oh, man, that sounds so good. I just got the number seven tray from them the other day. That oh, that is it, Mom. Good good, good you one. Get the parties, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I'm just going to show the cover of this because I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. I was driving. We came up to my mom's uh, this afternoon. I'll tell you a little bit about the day. What a stunning cover that is. And you know what? This fits in really well with our episode tonight. It looks like a, like a crop of a home. Um, very nice. It reminds me, who's that quilting art, art artist? Ricky, is it, not Ricky Timms, is it? Ricky something who does a lot with houses, right? Colorful houses, very 80s black and white quilters out there. Do you know who I mean? Ricky something um, does a lot, does stuff that looks just like this to me and so pretty, so pretty. And I wanted to say thank you too because I was already alerted and I'm extremely proud that on the first page in the... I shouldn't even do this, should I? I'm such a bragger. It's President's message from Trisha Ta Travis. She says, she gives a shout out. Does, doesn't she give a shout out? Yes. And I want to thank Deanna with Ribbon Candy Hooking for the unboxing of the August-September issue of Atha Art of Rug Hooking Magazine on her YouTube video. It is nice to see and hear her give a shout out to our wonderful magazine. Thank you to Ribbon Candy Hooking. That's one of the first times we've been acknowledged in public. That is fantastic. I consider that a big step, and I'm super proud. So we will be looking at this issue of Atha on Monday. Okay, Monday coffee time. That's what we are up to. I was excited about that. Susan, good to see you. Uh, uh, Baden or Baden, Ontario, Canada. You know, there's a lot of friends in Ontario. It really is. Dave is up there too. Lot, yeah. um, I can see a trip to Canada being a really fun thing because there's a lot of buddies up there at this point. <laughs> Let's see. Catherine, good to see you. Saying hi to Teddy too. I'm sure he'll be back. Lori, great to see you. I'm sorry I'm going to miss you tomorrow. I'm such a jerk. There's a hooking event tomorrow and I'm just I'm just at a point where I have to admit I am um, I am out of steam a little bit. And um, this is a quiet weekend for me, sandwiched in between some horrifically busy weekends. So um, so I decided sort of last minute to come here to my mom's house. You can see I'm in a different place. And to do this episode about home, which is kind of ironic because this is not the house where I grew up by any means. But it's her home now. And you know her, right? We know her and love her. But we are all here tonight. Oh, that's okay, Patricia. Gayla, great to see you. It was great having you on. Kayla says hi to Teddy, too. Teddy's got a lot of fans and a lot of friends. Thank you, Teresa. I'm really happy about that. Oh, all the friends are here, Mom. Oh. <laughs> uh, Nada, I will remind you. I'll just send you a message on Thursday. I post it either on the Wednesday Coffee Time video at the end, all the Zoom info, and I also post it in our Facebook group, which is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club. So it'll be in both of those places, but I'll, I'll make a mental note also to send you a message with the Zoom info so you can log on that way too. That would be fantastic. Um, so, funny episode. Oh, Teddy already destroyed the set over here. Funny day it's been, you know, um, kind of making last minute decisions. I, I changed the date of the dyeing class, the, the all tie dye four seasons class was meant to be this coming Sunday. And I had to change it because my, and I'm not dissing Amazon because I use them all the time. Um, but, you know, stuff is just uh, not coming on time. 
it is what it is so i had to push that back a couple of weeks and as a result that made this weekend mom the only weekend i have between what feels like now and death free i mean like really because oh, next weekend always... i know next weekend on saturday the weathersfield fair right the historical society if you're in anywhere in connecticut i'll be at the weathersfield fair with ribbon candy hook and tent and then on sunday i'm teaching at madison wool again i'm doing the the pumpkin sugar skulls first time i've taught that class in person and um and then on sunday night i'm teaching the frida class designing like frida so it's going to be a jam-packed weekend coming up this coming weekend so i might as well right now get cozy and start this episode this is just a great i feel this is a great episode tonight this is very different than what we normally do it's an extra cozy episode so be prepared be warned it is a night of looking at rugs uh that around the theme of a house right house rugs um, and a little bit of poetry because I found a great source of some very cozy poetry that I think will fit beautifully with our rugs. I have so many announcements, but let's just do them on Monday and let's get into our commentary for this weekend. Um, so, you know, this whole idea, the subject of rugs really came to me when I, and maybe you remember this from a past coffee time, I ordered, see, I'm having problems with my arm now. I finally went to physical therapy after first one. the first one. And I, I, I know so many people are writing and saying, just do it, stop being a baby, stop being lazy and whatever. Uh, nobody actually said that, but I was being um, a bit on my high horse and I'm just too busy mm -hmm. to be sitting around in stretchy pants on the floor of some place wasting time. But I did do it today. And I'll tell you, they did some exercises to my arm that are just were unbelievably intuitive and smart. They seemed to immediately know what the problem was. And then they did some Frankenstein style electricity. I don't know if anybody's had this yet, but it caught me by surprise, I have to say. I felt like Frankenstein, right? Super Halloween-y. They clipped a bunch of these node things to me and started ramping up the machine. And it felt like so zingy. And I thought um, it, it, was, it didn't have a shape at first. It was just a bit painful and pinchy. And I thought, how far is this gonna go, right? Like I was really starting to panic. Um, and it went quite far, but in the end, it, you know, my arm, my arm feels a little bit better. So thank you for encouraging me to go. I still haven't gone for the x-ray. I don't have time for that, <laughs> but I'll do this. I'll do this little thing they're asking me to do. And I am wearing my pajamas tonight because this is the home episode. I hope you are cozy too. This is the thing that got me going, thinking about home. How many hooked rugs do you see out there with a house in them? It's a lot, isn't it? It's a ton. And why are there so many? Hello, Linda. Thank you, finally, right? I'm going to go once a week on Wednesdays, and we'll see what they do. It was a lot of sitting around, I have to say. It was a lot of wasted time. But if it makes it better, and at the end of the day, if you're interested, because a lot of people have been very solicitous and caring and written, um, it's not a tear. It is what is called, here it comes, frozen shoulder. Is it a thing? Or did she make that up just for me? Frozen shoulder. It had a much longer name that I didn't I didn't get, but um, she said it's unofficially called frozen shoulder and it's a very mysterious ailment. And I said, is it is it in my head? <laughs> because if it is, you need to tell me. I don't want to waste time on stretchy pants on the floor every week if this is something in my head. And she said, no, it's something that people can get. And sometimes it lasts six months, sometimes it lasts six years. And she said, you just, you work through it and try to um, not aggravate it too much. So that is a huge to be continued. Yeah, I'm amazed. You know, you all were writing about PT physical therapy, and I just thought, this is so silly. But it did it did actually help. They really knew what they were doing. They looked like they were 19, both of the girls that helped me. But, yeah, it's real. It's Is it a real thing, Linda? Frozen, sh frozen shoulder? It sounds like somebody's giving sounds you like the cold nice shoulder, <laughs> right? That sounds like a joke. A parfait. But, <laughs> a parfait. Um, but, you know... When I see rugs, hooked rugs, when I'm out in the world and I'm at antique stores and I see rugs with a home and it always really strikes me. Now, some of them I recognize as commercial patterns because I'm always looking at old catalogs of commercial patterns, but some of them just strike me as a portrait of somebody's home. And, you know, this whole subject of home is so huge, isn't it? Because it's different for each of us. And it's something that I think about often because we do a very cozy craft. And we are a group of people who are united in uh, having this great thing in common. And we feel the same way about it. And we know that other people don't feel the same way about it. So it's good to touch base with each other and talk about it and think about it and brainstorm and snowball and all the things that we do. 
But at the end of the day, your home is very different than my home, isn't it? We all live in different parts of the country. Uh, it might be that our buddy in Australia logs on. There's people in different parts of the world. Everybody is in a different place and considers different things home and different things cozy. And while I was reading that book that I was talking about a little bit on Coffee Time, the book Cold Cozy by Isabel Gillies, it really made the connection between the idea of things being cozy and being at home. And they are two distinctly different things, right? But for all intents and purposes, the feeling of home should make one cozy, right? The idea of nesting, of having your things about you, of having things that your eye catches that make you feel comfortable and at home, the ultimate cozy, right? So for me, it's like my Barry Manilow records when they're playing on the record player or, or stacked up like they're about to, or when I see all the spines of my Judy Bolton books, also the Nancy Drew, but mostly the Judy Boltons, and all of the things about me that I associate with being cozy and being at home, cozy and at home are often the same things if you're lucky enough to have a good home situation and you enjoy being at home but at the end of the day when you think about home for you you might be thinking you're, you're definitely thinking about something different than I am because I'm probably thinking about the house that I grew up in in Barrington Rhode Island the house that I would rather rather have than any other house in the whole world more than a castle I would rather buy that house than any other place in the world but, you know, all of the houses since then have been home, but they're not the ones that I think of as home. And you probably have a place like this, too. So sometimes when we think about home, I think we're thinking about if you're very lucky, your current house or your childhood house or maybe your neighbor's house or a friend's house growing up where you spent all of your time. I think about Gail's house where we sat on her bed and logged hours in listening to the Thriller album, right? That was like home for me too. Um, but some people I think when they think about home or making a rug about home, it might be a place that they have never been. It might be a fantasy place or a dream place or a cottage in the woods or by a lake or by the ocean. It could be a castle or something very, very different. And that's why I love to find these rugs with houses on them and all kinds of like dwelling type things on them because they communicate a lot. And one of the things I've noticed, oh, Nada says, Nada, you had some great information, some great insider information. Adhesive capsulitis, that's exactly what she said, is the medical name. That's exactly what she said. And as soon as she said it, it went like this. And then she said frozen shoulder. And I thought, you're joking, aren't you? You're joking. <laughs> Danita, hello in Florida. I love your orange. That looks so nice. Speaking of home, right? Mm. That's a completely different thought. We lived in Florida in Fort Myers for you one had year. We had a beautiful. Cottage. I had my own home in the back of our house when we lived in Florida. It was a guest cottage and it was very right deluxe. Pool. That was the year dad thought he was Hemingway and we all had to move to Florida oh, yeah. and it was <laughs> filled with bugs and insects oh, and we just, lizards. It, I would love to go back there now as a grown up, but at the time it was very hard to move away from my home in Rhode Island and to go somewhere as a junior in high school where you know that I was a huge loser it, just because I was the new person mm -hmm. and I was not a bathing suit person or a beach person. Dave, there you are. Good evening. Heather, good evening. I got to work on your thing, Heather. I have a vision. So the thing that got me started on this subject of home and thinking, thinking really in detail about every rug that I see that features a home is this one. And I showed you this on Coffee Time a long time ago. But you remember this one? Let me make sure that you can see it. I mean, it's so different. I found this on Facebook Marketplace. And this is the back of it, but this is the one that's colored better. I haven't done my color touches that I will do to the front. Um, so I'm going to show you the back because it has that beautiful pink sunset. This is a bit of an anomaly, this one, because it looks like a Cape Cod house. I mean, it is a Cape Cod style. Um, but there is, you know, as I remarked the first time, this strange kind of fiery red happening inside the house, which is like, good Lord, I hope the house isn't on fire. on fire. Right. But it's also, it's, you know, stylistically a very nice choice. It's a good complement to all the blues in that lime green. Yeah. Um, but in the distance, there are some quite uh, large hills or possibly a mountain. So it's not definitely not Cape Cod. Super flat. And also we've got a lot of birches, which we don't see a ton of on the Cape. Mm -hmm. The Cape is like over 90% silica or sand. So we not a lot of... Um, um, scrub trees pine. it really take yeah. root yes yeah, scrubby type pines and all those those kinds of so it looks like a cape cotter but it's not a cape cotter which well, it's, it's not on cape cod it's gorgeous but it brings up mm. the question whose house was this i know 
I mean, isn't that the thing? Mm-hmm. I had to get it because I thought, whose house was that? I mean, it's the house of someone who hooked, right? Because it's not a commercial pattern. I, at least I have not find it, found it, and I have looked exhaustively for it. But whose house was this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's the thing at the end of the day. When you think about house rugs that you see, if they are not commercial patterns, they are often big farmhouses that you imagine are at Maine or New Hampshire or Canada, something like that, some big old house where somebody back in the day, the 19th, maybe early 20th century was hooking and they hooked their house. Now, what you don't see are houses that are sort of less picturesque, right? How many rugs do you see that depict like a skyscraper where the idea is like, I live in here? Or um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just seems to me number game that, um, you know, people who love rug hooking and, and exceptionally cozy things tend to be people who also like older houses and living in certain locales, very sort of country interests. So you tend to see houses that are big old farmhouses on hooked rugs, um, Victorians, old houses, because these things kind of go together. Rarely, rarely do you find a house um, that is obviously a, this is my house, this is where I live, that's outside of that sort of genre. And I don't know if I've ever found one like that, but from a collecting point of view, if you were to fi- find a house that is like, this is where I live, and it showed some kind of a very urban setting or a very modernist house, I don't mean a 1940s ranch or a mid-century modern ranch, I mean something really new, that would be an exceptional rug to snap up because that's going to be a real collector's piece. It's a total anom- an anomaly. We just don't see that in rugs. Beautiful rug with New England trees. The birches are very New Englandy. Cozy home sounds like Danish term. Heiche is that you do with the G's too, which is very in these days. With Danish, everything is always in it, isn't it? It's the height of sophistication and design. It's funny that you say that. Hello, Carol. It's funny that you say that because um, Susan in Dutch, and I was born in the Netherlands and I lived there for a long time. The Dutch have this word that they really own and are proud of. I think if you asked any Dutch person, if they were to name one word in their language that they thought was the most unique, they would choose the word hezelach, which means, they say it doesn't, but it means cozy. And they claim that this word hezela um, is like is different than the word cozy because it means more cozy than cozy. It, it's more descriptive than cozy. But in my opinion, at the end of the day, it it is the Dutch word for cozy. But it is a word that you hear people using all the time, and they don't just use it for things that are cozy. They use it for things that are familiar. So this is another. We're going to get to rugs, but this is another side thing that I've been thinking about reading this book, cozy. And thinking about how in our lives, right, doing hobbies that we like, because we know we have a lot in common. That goes without being said. You know, no matter how chaotic life is and all of the things, and I think 2020 taught us this, all of the things that we cannot control or we cannot change, we have no power over, those things can be very upsetting and unsettling and uh, really sort of um, kill your happiness and your momentum, right? So those are things we can't control. But in reading this book, Cozy, she reminded me, the author reminded me that there are so many things that you can control because you can do things, you can participate in things, and you can surround yourself with things that make you feel, in her word, cozy. For me, more like at home, right? Recreating home. You can force those things, and those things will give you constant visual reminders that you are in a safe place, that you are in a happy place, that you have happy things to think back on, to look forward to. Um, So all of these things are interconnected, right? But there is definitely a distinction between things that are familiar and things that are related to home. And I want to make that distinction because we're just looking at things like houses and dwellings on tonight's episode. I do want to, in the future, look at things. I want to create a database. This sounds crazy, but I want to create a database within our group where we have a kind of a laundry list of all of our favorite things. Like, don't write raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. I want to start recording, and I'll do this formally, what your favorite things are. I want to have a huge list of our favorite things, and I don't know what I want to do with them yet, but I know I want to do something with them because these are shared things that make us feel at home and make us feel cozy. And I know I, there's some overarching plan I have for them. I just haven't refined the plan yet. So be thinking about your things that make you feel at home, right? 
So let me just catch Joy. You made it. Good to see you. It is hot up here, isn't it? Maybe it's open that the bulb. Behind you. Maybe it's that bulb in my face. Let me open no. this window before I, don't I know expire. If it's open. Is it unlocked? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it's up. Is it? It is should. It? Let me try yeah. just doing this. Yeah, because it is. Like, you got woo! it. Look at that. It's so nice and cool outside, and I'm feeling like I'm. Uh, yeah. Roasting, roasting in a cauldron. Open the, uh, one near Ted too, to get a All right, I'm getting some breeze going here, man. Um, but anyway, I just love this subject of home. And I've been searching for rugs for the last few days here and there as I've had time. I've put together a great collection of rugs to show you tonight that revolve around the idea of home, different people's idea. And looking at rugs that people have made, when you see a rug that somebody made of their home, isn't that the most amazing calling card? Because they're basically saying, it's not a welcome mat, right? And it's not a Victorian motto. They love that image and what it represents so much that they're going to spend the time to hook it into a rug. So this is really something to think about as a subject. Maybe you think, oh, I'm not good at hooking buildings or it's just not my thing. Think about it. Think about whether it's your current home or some other place that's been special to you that you might want to use as a composition because these rugs come out with so much heart right, built into them and they're so interesting to look at. So I got, I got thinking about home and to preface uh, looking at our rugs together, I pulled out, do you remember, let me take a quick sip. Mm. Jenny, I didn't see you. Happy Friday night. Happy cocktail night. Good to see you. Do you remember, these These are super corny, warning, corny alert. Um, I find these in antique stores a lot. Do you remember the series of magazines and compilations of poetry and prose uh, by ideals? Ideal. Right. Yep. Ide they were, it's very much on the religious side, but not every item is super religious. And they are just uh, 1960s era compilations of beautiful poems. And I went through this particular one. This is in 1965, and this was their compilation on home. Because it put me in the mood and it got me going with ideas for tonight. And it's loaded with the most sweet, charming, old-timey poetry. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the poems that I pulled out of it. Um, this is by Bessie Carey Dunn. And it goes like this. Home is where the heart is, and friendship is a guest. A book, a fire, a hand clasp, a place where one can rest. Home is where the heart is, where children's voices ring. A blossom at the window, a tiny bird to sing. Home is where the heart is, be it mansion on the hill, or cabin in the valley, or cottage by the rill. Home is where the heart is, where friendship is a guest, where love and faith and gentleness can soothe a heart to rest. That is so signature, mm. uh, like mid-century poetry, isn't yes. it? It is a little bit on the corny side, but, but it is simple. so sweet and simple. Mm. And it mm. says it all. It's like an extended Hallmark card, isn't it? It's, it's so cute. So let's look at some rugs. I have some other little poems I want to show you. And I found a poem that really got me going down a rabbit hole for next week. Um, more on feed sack, so more of a quilting bend than a hooking bend, but we talk a lot about sacking as backing fabric. One of the poems I'm going to pull up probably on Tuesday will be about that because it was just a great rabbit hole I want to share with you. So I pulled up on, in all kinds of places um, hooked rugs that featured houses, right? And I started to look at them in some detail. I was particularly looking at older ones because it's very easy to find the new ones on Etsy, um, mostly on Etsy, right? And all the rug hooking groups are, everybody who designs rugs does rugs that include a house. And I have to say, right at the beginning of the episode, one of the omissions tonight, um, there were so many rugs of houses by Janet Connor, which is J. Connor Hook Drugs, her website. Um, I was having trouble pulling them off because I got late, but she had some beautiful rugs of all different styles, and I love her website anyway. We talked about her with her book, Magnificent Hook Drugs. She does a lot of stuff with a very sort of fine art bend. Her website was great for finding um, images of hook drugs of houses, again, of very different styles. But I found this one on eBay, eBay, Canadian eBay. It is, I think, currently, yep, yeah, this is currently on Canadian eBay. So in American dollars, $140 plus $20 shipping, very simple rug, and it's called, if you're interested in it, Early 1900s Antique Hooked Rug Folk Art with Birds and a House. It's a mouthful. It's very descriptive. But this is what it looks like. So this is currently there, if you are interested. Very, very simple, right? Very, very simple. 
and you know the, I'm starting with a real simple image I hope it's kind of in focus it is an eBay photo but you know we've got some great symmetry going on here in a very simple house at first I thought it was a schoolhouse and then I thought no I think it actually is like a little cabin but some really nice symmetry here just a very naive composition like you could fold the paper in half and you'd come up with the same on both sides right kind of composition we'd like with just a slight variation that makes it interesting and asymmetrical like the difference in the trees the branches and you see this here just a little bit of business here there's a little bit of flower scattered on the walk now as naive as this rug is they did pretty good with the perspective on the walkway right leading up to it it has the right shape it goes wide and then narrow to meet the door that's quite good for a rug that's this basic and they did a nice job with the two little birds perched on top of the trees it, they almost look like um uh filials finials filials finials yes. they're big though they're big uh, they're yeah. They're big. One of the great sort of look. signatures of folk art is the perspective yeah. is way off here. But that is one of the things I may I think that makes this rug a bit more valuable. Um, also more valuable than what it's what they're charging for it. The background too, the mixed colors, right? A little bit of blue and green here uh, in the sky as well. But on the ground, you get more of the impression that they were running out of colors, which is so nice. Really nice rug. And again, if you're starting collecting, you're interested in collecting. Canadian eBay. So that's $20 shipping to the U.S. So for people in Canada, if you if you fell in love with this rug, it would be even cheaper um, to ship, of course. So I just thought that was really, really sweet. And that also reminded me an important piece of business that I need to tell you that is so exciting. To remember the show that we did, we did a week of Alice Butler, remember, and her son Vic, who designed the rugs. They designed the rugs together, and then he went away. And, and then I started working on this relationship with them, which I have going, and I'm in touch with the family. And it's the nephew, Rob, who I've been talking to lately. And I am going to put those designs out. Ribbon Candy Hooking is going to put the, all the Alice Butler designs out, and they will be available to you. And the family is so excited and proud that these designs will be available for the first time to the public. But this morning, Rob wrote me, Rob Butler, and said um, that he found a rug that was not in the book. It was just a rug that slipped through the cracks. And he drew it out for me so that I have the sketch to work off of um, the line drawing so that we'll be able to put that up. So those are coming soon. But it was a huge event this morning. As you can imagine, when I was half asleep and I opened up my messages and I saw that Rob had written and said that they found another Alice Butler rug. So that will be coming to you soon. He said, make sure that your group knows they're coming and that there's this new one. So I'll show you that this week, too. It is a lovely one, too. It's very artsy and mid-century very different oh you got your alice butler book today april how how perfect is that isn't that funny i'm so I'm, it took a while didn't it synchronicity yeah. but those i feel like those rugs are such a moment in time and they're so different than everything else that they need to be honored and catalog and um made public those those images need to be made public because i know there's tons of people who want to hook them and i want to hook them too so the thought that there was a new one that wasn't even in the book everyone's going to want to hook, everyone's going to want to hook the new one i know <laughs> it's very artsy and abstract it's very different mm. but like like many of them it was a really vic rub, rug rug it was a vic rug it is exciting kaz mm. it was great news so then this rug came up one of the sources for finding rugs to show you tonight was my phone because when I go around and I look at antique stores um, I always take pictures of the rugs and I always post them in our group ribbon candy hooking and I always say in that moment I'm at you know I'm in Maine or I'm in New Hampshire and I'm at this antique store uh, these are the rugs I'm seeing you know if you're interested give them a call uh, and sometimes I know people do because sometimes people have written and said I called and I had them ship it because we had a rug like that growing up and I haven't seen it since. So it works out well, the system of sharing this sort of unofficial rug database um, until we have a more official one with you. And this is one that I found in Sandwich on Cape Cod uh, in 2019. This is one of those, the one who got a ways for me. I know we all have those in different different parts of life. Sometimes it's a person... For me, it's a rug, and this is the rug that I am so sad that I didn't get in 2019. I saw it in uh, the end of May. Bring in focus here. And all it said, the reason I didn't buy it, right, I was just starting out the company. I had no extra money at all, and we were just starting a two-week trip on the Cape with the family, and I wanted to be able to, you know, buy the kids stuff and not be a 
total pig with money. Hey, Donna! Oh, I'm so glad you're there. It's good to see you. I want to see you in person, too. But, you know, this one was there, and I remember it cost $675, and I thought that was substantial, and it said, um, there was a little sign that said, like, no flexibility or no movement or something, and I thought, whew, that's off-putting. But it also said it was a farm on uh, in somewhere in New Hampshire, and this is one of these rugs with the you know rainbow over it. It has shades of Lucy Trask, but obviously none of that kind of detail. I just fell in love with it. It was just too much money at the time. And when I went back the next time, which was like six months later, it was gone. And I keep going back to that store thinking maybe maybe it didn't sell. And the persons who stole this is, um, maybe they took it away and they're going to put it back out in the future. So I always check. But I think probably it sold because it's very good. It's very good. Um, and, you know, just that very cryptic note that it was a farmhouse in New Hampshire didn't tell me anything about whether it was found at an estate, you know, farmhouse that looked like this house, but it did give me that feeling. Hi, Laurie. It did give me that feeling, it is exciting, of where is the house. And I did, I did get that immediate itch. Get in the car, drive to New Hampshire, start driving down all the back roads there are, and see if you can find this house. Of course, it might not even be there anymore. But it just, it just fed into this thing I have about these house rugs. And when you look at it, you immediately think, where is it and who lives there? All these questions pop up. And then since, since there's no way of knowing the answers to these questions, um, you have to imagine the endings, right? And then you're creating all kinds of stories in your head. You know, that one time that was an exception, Mom, was when I found a painting at a flea market. I still have it. I found a painting at a flea market also on Cape Cod in Wellfleet. And it was of a house and and it was in such poor shape it was bad it was super bad but i thought it was charming i thought it had something and when i pulled the back off because i wanted to if I, I never reframed it but i wanted to the back was all moldy and gross so i, I peeled it off and when i did there was an address in there mm. and it just said rendezvous lane and i thought oh that could be anywhere and then the next summer when i was driving up route 6a on the cape again I, I oh, got stuck at a stoplight at Rendezvous Lane, and I thought, could this be run? Could it be the one? And I drove up and down that street so many times, and I found the house. And the house had changed because it was an old painting. It was like an early 20th century painting. I found the house, but it had like an addition on it, and there was an extra dormer window. But you could see clearly the position of the water and the rest of the house because it was empty at the time and for sale, and it cost a fortune. fortune. Yeah. A fortune but um it was the house and that was exciting that never happens and i keep saying and i'm such a jerk but i keep saying next summer next time i go to the cape i'm going to bring that painting and i'm just going to drop it off i'll wrap it up and drop it off on their doorstep and just hope that the people that own that house because it's not a good painting it's just charming i think it was probably painted by the person who lived there at the time but it is it's not good by any means but it's the house I'm hoping that the people that live there um, appreciate the surprise because what a great surprise that would be, wouldn't it? Would I would love to be surprised like that. So I'm going to do that next time. I'll tell you when I do it. It'll be fun. So that this is the one that got away from me, and I found that one on Cape Cod. If you know where that one is, if you see it pop up at another antique store, maybe somebody bought it to flip it. I want to buy it really bad. And, you know, this one here, this one was a wor it sold on um, eBay, it popped up on Worth Point. Let me show it to you first because this is a gorgeous one. The light is a little bit tough. I'm sorry about that. This is dark anyway, and it has a shadow in it from the person who took the original photograph. But this is a very different house. You know, look at the way that they've handled the tree, almost like a stained glass piece, right? The sky. This is very, very artistic hooking, isn't it? sort of weird border look at the border it's almost like little clumps of rocks or stone wall lots of interruptions looks like a little bit of possibly water in the distance although it could be a meadow impossible to tell unless you know the house could be many houses couldn't it definitely looks like a new england style house and look at the way they've handled a nice sort of um it looks like an 1820s house to me with these giant uh floor to ceiling windows but look at the way they've handled all of the elements of it. You can tell that they were a bit confused about how to do the trees. And as a result, they did them as kind of a scribble. But I have to say, I am in love with the way that they've done it. I don't know that I could do that if I tried. I'd have to truly copy. Um, because that is hard. They have come up with a stylistic solution 
to a very tough problem, which is shading in trees, right? The structure of the tree. But I mean, the trees are what they are. They are one style. And I like it. Maybe you like it. Maybe you don't. But you have to agree that the house is really something else. The way that they shaded the chimneys, the light and the dark, really good, right? So I'm going to ask you now, hopefully you love this rug as much as I do. It was on eBay in December of 2017. How much do you think that that rug sold for? Because I think it sold for, I think it sold for the wrong amount and it breaks my heart. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'll tell you in a minute, I'll see if anybody guesses. At the end of the day, this is just, this is a rug of somebody's house and they loved their house enough to hook this rug. So I think it is just exciting, right? Exciting. Now I know you're in different time than me. There's a little delay, but I will tell you that this exceptional, not commercial pattern of a rug that somebody took the time to do and took the time to figure out how to do these trees. This sold in December of 2017 for $72. Oh, God. I mean, it just, it seems like a crime oh. against art. Oh. It seems like uh, humanity, right? It's gorgeous, isn't it? Gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Mm. It's somebody's home, right? This meant so much to somebody, this house, that they made this rug out of it. And, you know, I guess in a way that portraits work the same way as, as pictures of houses, right? Mm. Because they can be problematic. When you see a hooked rug that is a portrait of somebody, at least for me, I'm typically not that interested because I don't know the person. And I feel the same way about painting and photography. Maybe that makes me a very lowbrow person. But I just feel like I cannot relate. I don't know the person. And I don't. The connection isn't there for me. Now, I suppose that can happen with houses, too. And I suppose it depends on you know where you're coming from and how you feel. But for me, I feel like house is a bit more... Um, it's a bit more public, isn't it? I mean, somebody owns it at that moment, but somebody else might own it next year or in a decade. It's it's there. It's a more permanent, you know, it's something that somebody else can drive by, right? Or enjoy or find at the end of some kind of crazy treasure hunt. If you're looking for one of these houses that you find on a rug and you only have one or two clues, like with the painting. I know, Patricia, isn't that a good story? Dave, wouldn't you think it would be $1,000? It should have been $1,000. It should have been sold uh, at Sotheby's or um, uh, Pook and Pook or something like that, and it it would have sold for I would say thousand, maybe even fifteen. It's that different and that good. <laughs> no, you didn't overdo it. You were right. Um, it's why it's always worth. I'm going to say it, even though it makes immediate competition. It's always worth looking on eBay, and also Facebook Marketplace. Even if you're not a Facebook person. You don't have to create an account. Just log on and see what's there, right? See if anything is worth setting up a Facebook account for because there are so many hooked rugs on Facebook that are local only. People will not ship them, right? They just don't want to be bothered. It's not enough money. But there are so many in your local area hooked rugs that are important and special that you might know the initials or you might know the maker or read the label and it might mean something to you. It's worth taking a look, hunting down these rugs. This is a nice rug too. This is in a completely different price range, I'm sure. I pulled this next image off of Keevan, K-E-I-V-A-N, uh, Woven Arts. They have a bunch of rugs, all different periods. Um, they're woven arts, so they don't, it was my impression from their descriptions that they didn't know a whole lot about hooked rugs in particular, and they just called this an American hooked rug, 1940. I, I question that um, in and of itself because this really looks to me, let me bring you right in focus, this looks to me like, if not a Grenfell rug, a silk stocking rug, um, maybe even more in focus, there we go, um, but at least in that style, possibly a Canadian souvenir rug. But what is making me think that? Well, the, number one, the color, the shapes, right? This looks like a hundred different Grenfell rugs uh, in the black border. Right. And looking at it close up, the loops look to me more like silk stockings than they do uh, cotton or wool. So um, I thought this was an interesting one. This is currently on Keevan again, K-E-I-V-A-N. And it's one of these. If you're interested, write them for the price. Um, this is an interesting rug. I would love to see the back of it. I'd love to see this in person. Uh, it has a great pastoral look. I love the cartoon quality of the house itself. Very different handling of trees here, isn't there? I mean, you see here the sort of ochre tree is more like a large bush or flowering something. 
but above it, they, they really, it's still a difficult handling for the maker of the trees. Background over here, too. And then this is sort of another thing that is bewildering. This is water, right? Because here's an island over here. Again, that connects me more to Canada than to America. And I don't, I don't know. I could be very wrong, and I probably am, but this doesn't look like a 1940s rug to me. This looks like more like um, 1910s, 1920s, and it looks more like a Canadian rug. So that might be one to follow up on. Um, I don't think I'm shopping um, in the sort of budget that I would be on this website, but if you probably have a different budget than I have anyway, Keevan Woven Arts, it's worth checking them out. There's quite a few nice rugs, and that might be one of these great rugs that is like an important rug that is mislabeled. I don't know, but you also might know a lot more than I do about Grenfell rugs and identifying them. Because uh, that seemed like there was a lot wrong with that listing, so possible big question mark there. Now, th another site that's really good for hooked rugs is Laura Fisher, right? Laura Fisher, that's the website. She does mostly quilts, but she occasionally does hooked rugs, and she does very cozy stuff. Um, she does quite, you know, quite high ticket items. So it's not this isn't this isn't one of the sites that I would shop on either at this moment, unless I become Claire Murray fingers crossed, and sometime in the future, and I'm shopping in a different price bracket, it's not one of the sites that I would shop on, but maybe you can shop on there, and if you can, you should, because she's got exceptional rugs. Uh, this is one of them. This is actually one of her, I think this is the lowest price item that I found at 895 I think it's a good price, um, this, rug, this rug, really, somebody's house, and again, very different handling. Things that I love about this rug, the cartoon quality, um, this does again look like a New England setting to me. It just doesn't look like Canada to me, but it has this slight storybook quality. It's got much of a cottage look, right, with these tall sort of cypressy trees. But this was very common to use these trees in the 1920s, whether they were actually part of the landscape or not. This nice sort of sage green right up alongside more of a spearmint green. And then the dark, dark forest. These were all very 1920s, 1930s signature tricks, right? Dark, light, dull, bright. And then here in the um, border, right? You know, beautiful black border. That is one of the great stamps of like the sort of art deco period of, of, of style and design. The border, the red border goes from this kind of peachy orange to this dark, dark cadmium kind of a red. And it looks to me because of the position of those colors even these little sort of blips up here, right? Look at those little blips that they put in the border, those little lines there. It looks to me like they knew that they didn't have enough or that they were intentionally making it look almost like a serving tray that had a highlight, right? They were giving it two different colors on the sides and the top bottom, and they weren't doing it. They could have easily done this in a geometric way and boxed off the border, right? The way that they boxed off the house with all these dark lines, but they didn't. They wanted it to look almost like it was glowing. It's really thoughtful handling of a very simple border. But the ghostly kind of windows that are just shaped out, boxy-like, you know, this to me is the equivalent of when people say, if you don't like doing faces, just leave a blank face. This is the same thing, isn't it? If you don't like doing details on houses, just leave a blank window. It certainly gives you all of the information that your eye needs to see. And look at that little sort of trio of gulls in the sky. Mm -hmm. Could not be any cuter or quainter. Mm -hmm. There's a second little sort of outbuilding here. Maybe that's like an early she shed or something or he shed. But so cute. Such a nice piece. Laura Fisher, she has dozens of rugs on her site. Uh, this was the only one of a house that I saw. So this is the one I pulled today. But she, I think, specializes in hooked rugs. Uh, based on quilting patterns. So she had tons of like log cabin, broken dishes, those kinds of things, hooked rugs. And they were gorgeous, and some of them were in a much higher price bracket, but you could see they were larger rugs, you know, whole room-sized rugs. Very good website, Laura Fisher. Dave says, the rugs are reminding me of uh, Clarice Cliff pottery. Absolutely. Well, that's the same exact era, isn't it? You always see, does anybody watch those British, I know I've said this, those British antiquing shows like Bargain Hunt with Tim Wanacott. He did it for decades. They are the best shows. And Clary's Cliff Pottery always comes up on those because it's very British, along with things we don't see here like Moorcroft, all these great designs to pull from that in the U.S. we really rarely see them, maybe more in Canada, right, Dave, with like the shared culture. But we never see Clary's Cliff in the U.S. I mean, I never do. Um, and it 
definitely looks like her. I would love to find some of her pottery. I would love to find it chipped and cracked so I could buy a whole set of it. Totally in that style. Good one. Dave, I cannot wait to hang out with you because we're going to have, we're just going to be talking for forever, forever. It's never going to end. Now, this next one is the one that I used for the thumbnail uh, for tonight's show. And this is a really special one to me. It's called Apple Tree Farm. And if you remember, I need to plan an outing for those of us who are in this part of the country to both the Sleeper McCann House, which is called Bowport in Gloucester of Perfect Storm fame, right? The boat in the movie. Um, Gloucester, which is on Cape Ann, north of Boston. And a sister property also owned by Historic New England in, we went there, Mom, in Ipswich, a few towns over, called mm. Cogswell Grant. Mm. Between those two houses, those are so two of the most spectacular um, stomach cramping collections of hook drugs you will ever see. Better than anywhere, right? I've not been to the Rug Hooking Museum in, of North America in Canada. But, I mean, for me, the, I've never seen so many rugs that are so good. Now, this is one of them. Um, one of the many. And this rug, as far as we know, has always been at Cogswell Grant in Ipswich. I want to I replan a tour of that. I had a plan of both houses toured for our group, a uh, plan for our group in 2020, and of course that fell through. And I really need to plan again, a day that we can go look at both houses, have a little bit of a discount on both, and just specifically look at hook drugs because they did offer to take out all the rugs and give us an all all rug tour. So beautiful, other collections aside, you know, clock them with your eyes, but to be there just to look at these rugs that are so important. This and they really appreciate Historic New England owns quite a number of houses um, that have all different collections of all different periods, right? There are even very modern houses, 1960s houses. And in those houses, they tend to have events like modern cocktail parties as fundraisers. But in these older houses, like a farmstead like Cogswell Grant, it is a house that is filled with collections. And the house was owned by Bertrand and Nina Little. And they were authors of books too. They collected primitives, uh, primitive everything. A lot of boxes, a lot of textiles, and a lot of hook drugs. So from everything that we know, this is early 20th century, from everything that we know, um, this rug called Apple Tree Farm was always owned by Nina Little at Cogswell Grant, and it's still there today, along with dozens of other rugs that look this spectacular. So the label on this rug uh, says, when the Littles began collecting hook drugs, uh, when the Littles began collecting, Hook drugs were believed to be appropriately ancient, right? So this is before we made the distinction between rugs made with different tools, before we really were thinking that hook drugs are middle 19th century things, right? And not er definitely not earlier. But Nina didn't know this yet because this hadn't been figured yet. We were still looking at sewn rugs as hook drugs. Um, in fact, as Nina later learned, most were made in the late 19th century. Even so, she was pleased to note that 50 years after she'd collected a number of them, they still give comfort to the feet, because they were using them underfoot, and pleasure to the eye. This is one of the first hooked rugs the Littles purchased, bought in Marblehead, Massachusetts in 1938. So this is a much older rug. Much older. Now that is somebody's house. Whose house is it? Now, judging from where they lived, all you know, Ipswich and all of Cape Ann is Salem is one of the towns up there. Rockport, Gloucester, um, these are Marblehead. These are just unbelievable old-time New England towns um, with so many original houses there that date back to the 17th century, right? Um, so this this wouldn't be that sort of era, but this looks like an early 19th century house in a beautiful rug with two matching trees on the side. Look at those two little stripies under the house that just sort of symbolize the lawn. Very, very simple. Almost looks like a salt box. It looks like maybe they crowded the windows in by accident. They were Maybe the house is a bit bigger than that. But filling space thoughtfully with little flowers, you know, really thoughtful. Really thoughtful. It's got a brown ground on it, but probably at one time black. There's a lot of color changing, a lot of different background fabric in there. Hey, Susie, good to see you. Gab Fest of epic proportions. I can't wait. I feel like it's sooner rather than later. So, you know, all of these historic houses, and I'm not going to start, 
but look at your local museums and historic houses and and don't just look ask them send them an email if you don't like asking things in person send them an email and say do you have any hooked rugs they might be sitting on a hutchinson or molly Nye toby or something super old and important that we would all love to see and they might not even know what they've got right super exciting there's this other great website that's called country and shaker antiques um, country and shaker antiques and they have gorgeous stuff too. Not a lot of rugs, but the rugs they have are spectacular. This is spectacular. This rug costs 400, uh, sorry, if it was 400, it wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be showing it to you. I'd be holding it up uh, for $1,200. Uh, this is another one of these great early rugs that is depicting, not a commercial pattern, depicting somebody's own house where they have um, done the sort of fold the paper in half composition theory and balanced it out perfectly on both sides. It's good to see you, Susie. Good to see, I'm so happy you're there. Happy Friday. It gives me a, a chance to do a little one of these. Ooh, ooh. My mom just ran away because it sounded like the kids were moving furniture or building an extension onto the house, you know. Who knows? But this one, certainly worth $4,200. You know, when you see a rug like this, you know it's not a commercial pattern. Let me just bring it in a bit more. This is somebody's home. Oh, kitty cat. I just saw that on one side there's a kitty, on one side there's a dog. All these classic elements of folk art. The wrong size of everything. The trees and the houses are okay. Uh, the animals are a little bit large. And certainly the pots of flowers, very large. But the hearts, doesn't that just, thank you, Susie. Doesn't that just ring uh, Pennsylvania, right? Using hearts like that and flowers. Birds, also birds squeezed in on the side. These sort of ear handled uh, jugs or vases, single flower, yellow flowers, friendship and hearts, right? Now, one of the th now this almost looks like a mansard roof, right? This looks like a very specific style of house. One of the things I love about this rug, look at those plumes of smoke coming out. Even those are symmetrical. It was like they really, I love that they did a dog on one side and a cat on the other. They were very, very, very keen to keep the symmetry going. And they must have heard somewhere or noticed somehow that it's important uh, to have symmetry, right? Symmetry creates safety and balance. Um, but this is a nice early rug, and it's certainly worth $4,000 without a doubt. This is a good-sized rug. It looks wider, longer, wider than a hearth rug to me. But probably it is for a very, very big early American huge hearth. That would be the entire wall, right? Because um, people would piece sacking together if they needed to or if they were working on some kind of an uh, homespun right that they got a hold of and they could make something larger they would but if people could they would make a rug that fit custom fit you know the heart that they had and many of these hearts were hugely long it wasn't like there was a standard size of hearth rug we use the expression hearth rug like it's supposed to do, um, um, have some connotation of an exact standard size doesn't at all it really it depends on the fireplace Right, every hearth rug fit a, a different hearth. Now this one is terribly out of focus, um, but I put it in anyway, so just know that I couldn't get it any more in focus. Uh, Pennsylvania hooked rug. This is another website I found, uh, sort of on the fine side. It's called Frylings, F-R-Y-L-I-N-G-S, antiques.com. Um, they had a couple of rugs that were interesting. They had more than a couple, but two of them had houses. The other one was, was spectacular, but it was very out of focus. On your computer, it will be fine to look at, but it wasn't fine to print. So this rug is, it, the, I'm going to give you the caption first. This rug on burlap is a hooked rug from the early 20th century and is professionally mounted for display, a very folky and colorful presentation with a house, trees, and clouds. And then it gives the dimensions. It says $495, which is a bargain. I'm going to give you this tip, which I know you don't need me to give to you. But when you get a description like that, that's not a lot of information, which means, number one, there's no provenance. Number two, the seller might not know a ton about hooked rugs, right? That goes without being said. Just early 20th century mounted for display. That's not, that's not a lot to know. Um, so sometimes those opportunities... When you're sure it's not a commercial pattern, that's a good time to buy, isn't it? Because you know you've got an original rug, you know it has some age to it, and you know that the person, this sounds awful, but who's selling it to you doesn't know more than you about the item. 
So when they know more than you or the same as you or they think they do, that there's going to be a struggle over the price, right? So it is still possible to get beautiful rugs that look like this for under $500. And again, remember, this one is not in focus. Very graphic. This is, you know, this looks to me, um, it, it, it's fine for me as being an early 20th century rug. I'd go for like 1910s, 1920s. Has that cottage feel. It looks like they really tried to make this rug look like their home. Uh, the different kinds of trees, where the trees are positioned, it looks like it might be, uh, there might be water, or that is just maybe the border, the blue border, it's hard to tell. Uh, there's mountains in the distance, the two stylized seagulls, a little bit of difficulty with the trees in the background. For whatever reason, they didn't want to outline the house in the dark black that they were outlining everything else with. And I think that makes this rug interesting. They, they wanted to outline the house uh, in white, as opposed to the black. And that was the, an exception that they made. So they changed their sort of uh, course partway through the making of this rug. We've got a very deflated cloud up there. We've got trees that have both sort of polka dots and skeletons. So somebody's experimenting with the composition of the tree. And behind the house, it's just kind of like bring out the leftover colors, the peaches, the sienna, the dark brown, the sage, and even the blue. And we're going to pop them into the trees. It gives them the look of, um, sometimes we see these older rugs that I always refer to as gumdrop trees um, because they have so many colors in them and it's, it's always going to be hard to know looking at a photo, especially an out of focus photo. It's always going to be hard to know, are these gumdrop trees the way, is that the way they were intended to look or have the individual colors that were hooked years ago changed color over time, right, with sun and time? Um, or did people run out of color and this is what they ended up with? It's impossible to know, but these are all part of the great mystery and conversation you have in your head when you find a rug and you're thinking about it and working it out in your head. It's great to find a rug like this. 400 and anything, what was it, 495? I think that's a good price for this rug. It is so different. It's so quaint and naive. It, it's not it's it's right on the edge for that price, isn't it? Because it's not old. It's not it's not a 19th century rug. It's an, definitely an early 20th century rug. We can tell by the style of the house, the color of the house. If this was an older rug, I'd fully expect this could be the architecture of the 19th century, like a farmhouse, right? Because farmhouses can be so many different styles. But I wouldn't expect to find it green, right, at all. And I wouldn't expect to find lights on inside. So for like my house here with the red lights inside, it is more of a 1920s thing to find people stylistically changing the color of the of the windows to show people are inside. Lamp light, you know, red. This this is a bit odd, but you see a lot of 1920s Art Deco era stuff where they filled in the windows of the house all with yellow. Like the house is glowing with welcome and the idea that there are people inside that are busy doing things and living, right? So very, very quaint, but it is right on the edge of not being old enough for that price. I think it's something that's nice to sit on if you're interested in this rug. It's not a huge amount for a rug that's original. It's a nice rug to sit on because in another 50 years, it will be older, right? You might as well, you might as well have it in the meantime. Now, this is a nicey too. This one is really different. It came from a site called Old Hope great name for a website they had lots of um hook drugs and every single one is sold and there's no further information uh, i was interested in all of them the website is there but nothing is available so old hope if you go on there you're going to see this rug and a lot of others that are super beauties this one this one is different again right i would call this a late 19th early 20th century rug it's antique black background some of the things that are making this rug different are number one, this is a this is someone's house, right? It'd be wonderful to find this house. This is quite a big house too, right? So whoever lived in this house had some funds, number one. And number two, still loved doing a thrift craft like rug hooking, right? So that in itself is a bit of a mystery. Now, besides that, we've got this very graphic cartoony style going on. They have it done black and white. They've outlined... They've got the windows outlined in rust and like the sort of edges of the houses in this rust color. The chimneys are quite light as if they're reflecting moonlight, right? And they've done a rust stripe at the top of the house, which makes me think, is that like some kind of copper flashing? Or is that also meant to be catching the moonlight? We're not getting a lot of shadows from the moon. But one of the things that I think makes this rug very good is it's a nighttime scene. 
and we never we rarely see nighttime scenes right so again we have the lit up windows and the assumption is this house is filled with people who are busy doing things and that is a cozy thought that is a happy thought and it's nighttime and it's still filled with light and activity so just a very different rug is it because they didn't have blue to do a sky maybe uh, does it matter it doesn't matter at all does it um, the one thing about it being a dark background is it's very hard to see how good the trees are the, the trees are really good yeah. and they are kind of ghostly gray green there's one over here too that's just as good with a few bits of lighter let me bring you right in being a stinker there we go a few bits of lighter color in them too really different right isn't that different that i mean considering the house is very basic very line driven but those trees are really good see everybody's good at different things aren't they when you're working on your stuff you love those trees kirsten oh hey lisa i'm glad you're there you are you're still catching some of it i've got to speed up though i still got a stack in my hand you might have to make a second night uh-oh i know i wanted to do some hooking tonight too I'm going to take a poetry break right here because this book, I, I was going through this book this morning and I had like misty eyes. It was so sweet and cute. Here's another poem about home to get you going. This is a good break to have another sip of your beverage, right? It's called That's a Home by Fred Toothacre. Toothacre. Tooth. Yep. T-O-O-T-H-A-K-E-R. I've never heard that name before. A home is more than just a house. It's more than roof and walls. It's more than just a place to rest where darkness, whenever darkness falls. A home you'll find is more than all the boards, the paint, the glass. It's where you find some happiness and blessings come to pass. A home is more than just a house. It's built of brick and stone. It's more than structure, beautiful, that man may call his own. Indeed, a home is more than lathes where plaster has been spread. It's where your plans are laid and where the Bible's always read. A home is where there's living. It's where your dreams come true. It's where the doors open wide for friends to enter through. Oh yes, it's where there's fellowship, where hope will never cease. A home is more than just a house. It's where your soul's at peace. Isn't that nice? It's that kind of sentiment, isn't it, that makes people hook rugs of their houses. This is like a Valentine's your house, isn't it? When you spend this much time hooking your house. Now, some of these rugs are a bit problematic because I took photos of them in antique stores and then I forgot where I was. Uh, all of the ones that are not marked, you will find somewhere on Rug Hooking, um, Rug Hooking in Punch Needle Club, our Facebook page, because I've posted them all at one time or another. I know this top one I found when I was in New Hampshire, but I just don't remember what store it was. It's not a great... I took the photo, but it's it. I can't say it's not a great photo. It's just a very faded rug, but I really liked it. I didn't buy it. It's probably still there. Uh, if I liked it and I didn't buy it, it means it was quite expensive. I, you know, I, I even remember uh, the store. I just don't remember the name of the store. Um, oh, thanks, Susie. You know, it, how cute is this with this little lane sort of meandering out that tweed door? Look at the tweed door, the tweed tree, and the tweed bush over to the side. And there's some kind of a field stone or brick foundation under this very little house. They've put these two, this little pair of birds up in the sky in this great plume of smoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that so evocative? Somebody's in there having a nice fire. That tweed door just gets me. I love, um, I love the paleness of it, right? Because it's, it's like something lost, something lost, something found. I, you know, I didn't turn it over because it was on the wall, but I would have liked to because the grass is quite sort of a burnt out sort of straw color, and the house is really burnt uh, or 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 um, washed out peach, and it might have been a completely different color. But there's no definition in the window panes. Very simple lines again. Strong uh, colors for the trunk in the house and the border, um, but definitely made from clothes, right? Leftover stuff. Um, this is this is not a rug that was made out of things that were bought at the local store for sure. That is a thrifty rug. This bottom one I remember, Mom, because we just saw it a couple weeks ago in Maine. 
uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was in New York, Maine. Um, it was one of the galleries there, and it was on the floor. And I, you know, I should have picked this one up. I don't think it was that much. But it's another beautiful house rug. Because I remember I said to you while we were there, we were dying for lunch. Mm -hmm. But I said to you, oh, look at that house rug. I'm going to have to take a photo of it if I ever do an episode on houses and hooked rugs. Because, again, it has that, I keep saying Lucy Trask. We are going to visit Lucy Trask soon because she's an important name in rug hooking but that very watercolor very wild look about it the handling of the trees and the water and the in the land in the distance the path leading up to the house with those stripes of color almost like train tracks very different it does have that 1910 1920 cottage look the red roof right the red doors the picture window all of these things are kind of clues to the period of architecture um, just a beautiful house, beautiful house, and certainly somebody's house, but you can see the position of the trees, the two trees off to the side, not a perfect composition, but because it is exactly this way, or it was when it was made. So another beautiful rug, it could qualify as a hearth rug because of the, the width of it, it's a very long rug, uh, I don't think it's that kind of age, but it might have been made to go on somebody's floor in some custom spot, another beautiful rug. Now this one, we showed not that long ago. Kira pulled this one up for one of our last bingo nights. Um, this one came from a uh, 2012 show in New York City. So very, I'm sure, expensive show. Um, and the caption said, Another rug that dealers will showcase is this whimsical house rug in a colorful garden and a folky tree design. I'm going to show it to you in a second. Just as a gardener would plan a growing space, the hooker of this rug gave its design a tremendous amount of thought. You have a wonderful flowing floral vine border, a house that is oversized in the center with a checkerboard roof. Then you have a number of wispy trees, says Jewett. This is the person that was putting the exhibit together or the sale together. He points out that a successful use of colors in the background, in the flowers and in the landscape of this rug also makes it a natural for fitting into a contemporary setting, right? Uh, the house is hooked on burlap and dates to the 1920s. So this might ring a bell if you were, I think it, our, I think it was our last bingo night. It was super colorful. It was a great find of Kira's, a great find. It was a good article too. Really spectacular border, skeletal trees again, wispy trees, that checkerboard roof, and just the curtains, right? I mean, look at the curtains. That is a moment in time that really dates this, this piece, right? Because... Uh, having those kinds of curtains is very 1920s, 1930s. Sunbonnet Sioux times, right? When you see those kind of handkerchief uh, valance type curtains hanging there. So pretty. So pretty. Now this one is a much, I think, newer rug. It's hard to say. I found this on a website called Go Hook It. So we know that website already. It's a blog spot. 2010. It was uh, January, February, March, April of 2010. Um, and she says here, I have a wonderful example of folk art, rug-wise. I love this little mat I saw at a friend's recently. Even the sky is amazing. Pink plus blue plus yellow and the childlike symbol for the sun in the corner. It was hooked with cut-up clothing, polyester, lots, but it's on a wall so it doesn't matter, right? And no, it doesn't matter. If it's not underfoot, you don't have to worry about it not being very a very hard-wearing textile. It can be a synthetic. Absolutely. You bring it in focus. So go hook it, blog spot. That is just a cute rug. So it sounds like it, a friend of hers either hooked it or had it. Probably hooked it if it's polyester, right? Because it's not super old. But it does have a very naive quality to it. Looks like there's a church at the bottom and the house right beside the church. Very cool colors. Really, um, really different composition, right? I love the irregular border. I love the polka dots just at the bottom. I love the childlike sun as well. There's a little bit of outlining going on in the sun, and it was discontinued. There's a lot of tweed employed in the roofs, right? Uh, the blue as sort of the uh, molding or trim color on the red red house. Very different and unusual architecture. But then that white shape behind um, with the bluer silhouette. Hard to know what that is. Possibly a big tree or a bush or something like that. Um, possibly just fill, just background fill. It's impossible to know. What a beautiful rug. This is another one I saw at one point. Another Cape Cod house, very similar to the one I have here. And I don't remember where I saw it. But it's worth showing. That does look like a Cape Cod house. 
super cute, right, Patricia? This is um, this is sort of sandy character of this house could certainly be Cape Cod. The border is helping a lot with the sandy character. Sandy character is a is a, a quote of uh, Henry David Thoreau's. He always talked about Cape Cod as having a sandy character, and this really, you know, the composition of this it looks like one of these little paths is leading to the house, right? But another looks like it's leading to the neighbor's house. This one going up here to some unknown spot, and that is also a bit mysterious and inviting. What a sweet house. You see the little bit of brick or flowers right in front of the front stoop and over on the side again. Very little going on with vegetation. It's a good view of the house. It looks like all sand. Little, It could be a sandwich or it could be further out toward Pro Peak Provincetown and all that. Could be right in the dunes. Could be right in the dunes. It does look like it's nestled. It looks like there's a lot of height and it's all sand with little tufts yeah. of, uh, little tufts of seagrass. Mm. Now this next one is really nice. Do you remember when we did this segment on Hooking Tavern Signs, that beautiful book by Carl and Mary Jo Gimber, uh, G-I-M-B-E-R? Um, we did that for like at least a couple of days, if not a week. And this is one of the rugs from that book that they did. It's an old tavern sign. And this is it here. And it's this, uh, not house, but this is an inn. And it was called Crow's Foot. But it's actually C-R-O-F-U-T. That's the family name that owned this. But um, they did it as a rebus, right? So crow's, crow's foot. Crow foots. No, crow foots. Yeah. C-R. And you know, it's so funny because I was driving the other day and I saw a street name that was C-R-O-F-U-T. And I thought, crow foot, just like this rug. And I hadn't thought of that rug for ages. So that name still exists. Hey, Marty. Oh, that house, oh, the little Cape Cod house looks like the one you built in the 80s. What a beautiful house that is. It wasn't actually little, was it? It looked enormous. Those houses are such creepers, aren't they? You get these Cape Cod houses and they sort of ramble. Oh, so good. I would love to live in that house, I'll tell you. But that's Crow's Foot. We haven't talked about that for a while, and that was a, that was a nice episode. This one I could use some help with. I don't know whose pattern this is, and I don't know if it's an old rug. I took a picture of it at some point, and I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know where. I'm such a jerk, right? And I was going to leave it out because I couldn't remember where, but I thought I got to show it to you. Look at how good this is. This is one of these again, fold in half DIY rug designs, where you fold it in half. It's very, very, very symmetrical, but it has this sort of patriotic flair, doesn't it? The thing that that breaks the symmetry of this is the flag. And I think that's very meaningful. It's the only thing that breaks the symmetry of this rug. This reminds me of Beverly because she loves patriotic subjects too. I love patriotic subjects. But I think this is very sweet. This very exaggerated hill with a little apple tree or cherry tree in front, which could be a hat tip to George Washington. At first I thought, is this Mount Vernon? But there's no way on earth. It doesn't look anything like it. And it's not the right size by any means. But it does have those eagles with the star on the breast and just beautiful, beautiful composition so different. If you recognize this rug, um, please let me know because I would love to give credit uh, if that is a new design that's made to look like an old rug, which it might well be. Now this one is a beauty too. This is so different, so simple. Next time you think to yourself, I can't design a rug, you can. Pook and Pook. So this is, Pook and Pook is an auctioneer that really specializes in folk art. They're my favorite. I mean, I love all the auctioneers, Skinner and uh, Sotheby's, and all of them occasionally have great rugs, but Pook and Pook always has great rugs, right? They specialize in this kind of style. And this is really different. It's a very scrappy rug. All of that background space, look at the size of this thing with this tiny little house in the center. So you can do this. You can do a composition like this. There's no attempt to put the ground in, right? It's a house with two flowers on the sides. And then the lamb's tongue around the central border. And then they've just flowered out the outer border and then whacked on the black border. So there's a, you know, there's a lot going on here, but it remains very unified, very simple. This is a design that anybody could do. You could, you could I was going to say steal, which you could. This is an old rug. Borrow this design, steal, borrow, whatever you want. Beg, steal, or borrow. But you could put your house, very simplified lines like this, right into the center of this exact composition. You can mix up the colors if you wanted, but it would come out looking like this, and it would be absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. 
Now here's another interesting one that's patriotic. This is a new design from an Etsy store called Village Folk Art. An Etsy store called Village Folk Art. And this is the Betsy Ross flag. Uh, this is punch needle, miniature punch or Russian punch, right? So this is the smaller scaled punch. But I mean, it's just an idea for a great design. Have you been to the Betsy Ross house in Philadelphia? That's one of the places I had to take my tour groups again and again. And again. But it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Down a pretty little cobbled road. Old Philadelphia. I'd always be on my way to the Franklin Fountain after that for some ice cream. Bring in focus here. Come on. Um, but this is just a nice example of using an old historic house in this, I mean, in this spectacular way. What a great composition. Look at the shapey border. You know, the house does not have this kind of vegetation around it. So this is kind of part imagined. It's just like a city street, right, with this beautiful old house there. It does not have this grassy lawn. Does, many of these elements are not here. What is correct is the shape of the house, and that's about it. And that's even a little bit uh, questionable. But the flag roof is a telltale and the flag balances and it does what it's meant to do which is to sort of uh, bring up uh, thoughts of the Betsy Ross house and of Betsy Ross and of the flag so it is a beautiful composition there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't weave in imaginary elements right it does not have many of the rugs that we're looking at tonight you can tell that they were very literal in the way that they added the flowers here and the trees here one tree here two trees there, two trees on top of each other here very literal, but you don't have to do that. You can think more in terms of design and do something like this. And hey, maybe it's hard for you to think of a house that means enough to you that you would want to hook it. So maybe think of a different place or a different house you've been or a historic spot that you've been that means a lot to you that you might want to hook that building, you know, shape shifters, placeholders, whatever works, right? Whatever works. Um, this is nice. Not Forgotten Farm. You know, Not Forgotten Farm. They sell a lot on Etsy. They do a lot, uh, sort of a fusion between uh, early American designs, very sampler driven focused kinds of designs um, mixed with um, sort of more modern colors and more pop art looking characters. Really good. Not Forgotten Farm. So this is, uh, I pulled this off, I think, Facebook. Another Not Forgotten Farm design. This is called My House. This is my favorite rug, and I kept it out most of the year. I, I didn't keep who wrote this post, but this is the design of the rug. And if you know, again, speak up. But what I love about this rug, and the reason I wanted to show this rug, pull this up here a bit better, is because, you know what, this one is in focus. I'm sorry. It's just, there we go. Um, again, folk art proportions, right? There's a lot off here in terms of sizing. But what I loved about this rug, I was trying to make the point with it that, you know, when you are struggling for a background, for a composition idea, and you have got your house standing out like that last little house, they boxed it out with, with lamb's tongue, right, borders, but you could easily drop your house into the center, whether there's a hill or not there. And then you can think about adding elements of a traditional sampler, because that's going to work, uh, including flowers, including weeping willows and weeping trees. It's going to work. So it's a great idea, you know, uh, uh, perching an oversized bird on the roof, if, whether it's a peacock or a different kind of a bird. Uh, it's going to work. It's going to work great. And then I had to pull up for you, this is not a hooked rug, just in contrast uh, to compare an antique needlework sampler by Phoebe Ann House of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, 1825. And uh, the inscription on this rug, it, I'm going to show you in a second, is to be good is to be happy. Uh, graphic, folky, and charming. At age 12, Phoebe completed this icon of American samplers under the instruction of 36-year-old uh, Columbia, Pennsylvania schoolmistress named Sarah McCardle. Phoebe, daughter of John House, a Quaker, and Esther Stamen, married Benjamin Taylor Davis in 1836 and had three daughters. Um, super cute. This was put up, this is sold, but this was put up by Stephen and Carol uh, Huber, H-U-B-E-R. So Huber at AntiqueSamplers.com. Their website is called AntiqueSamplers.com. So this is a sampler, and I just want to put it alongside this. Let me make sure you can see, right? And they, they're nothing alike, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, they quite are, right? So I'm just making the point, if you're thinking about doing a house design, 
you do you draw your house like this, it, but you think of things like this, and you pull books out of the library and on the internet searches that look like this, because you're going to plug in the elements that you really like, and you end up with something like this, something that, even a bit more manageable uh, for rug hooking too. Danita says, "My house, how clever with sampler mode." Yep, yeah, right. I mean, why not? How great is that? And then you have the options. You want to put the whole alphabet in there, or did you want to put specific words or letters or dates? Um, there are all kinds of things that present themselves because the sampler, that one happens to be the alphabet. But when you see those letters flying in space like that, your brain says that's a sampler. So it's not necessarily going to say, oh, she didn't include every letter of the alphabet. What's going on? You know, you could choose letters that are important or initials to people's names or dates that are important rather than putting the whole sampler uh, alphabet out there. So that's another thought to further personalize. Gail, I was just talking about you. I said you might log on from Australia because this episode is about home. And we're talking about how different all of our homes are. And I said, if our buddy from Australia logs on, she lives in a very different place. Her home is very different than ours here, where we are with the rest of us. I think a lot of us on the East Coast, but also on the West Coast, right? Of North America. Good to see you. Now, you know, that reminded me of, I might have to carry this episode over to next week. I think my mom is right because I haven't even started part two. Um, looking at that sampler reminded me of uh, mottos. You know, if you do shopping in, in antique stores, um, you've seen mottos. And mottos are embroidered, usually cross-stitch, long, skinny, rectangular, um, samplers of the day like girls would do them as practice right and they were always very um usually very religious right but occasionally you got um, home sweet home god bless this home this kind of thing but the reason i started thinking about mottos uh, is because they're hand work again using a needle but because they are celebrating home right and if one generation or one era of people knew how to celebrate the home, it was the Victorians, right? The amount of color, the amount of layers, the amount of decoration, vignettes within vignettes. They were people who celebrated the home above all things, right? So mottos were a big deal for them. And I pulled up this just to make the point. This is something else to think about. I know a lot of people look for hooked rug patterns that have a little bit of a religious sentiment to them or just sort of old-timey sentiment to them. Looking at mottos, M-O-T-T-O, -T -T just Google antique mottos, Victorian mottos, you get all kinds. And why not plug your house or your schoolhouse where you went to school or anywhere that's important to you, right? Your favorite shop, your neighbor's house, your favorite, your favorite building in town, your current church. Why not plug it into a motto? Because this person did God bless our home. And then this is somebody's house. I mean, that looks like a new, like a late Victorian new construction, doesn't it? I mean, that's somebody's home. Um, it's not like the ideal home. It's it, it looks like somebody's home to me. And why not? Why not do something like this, right? You could you could change out the font and make it a bit more doable. But I think that is just gorgeous. And just note again, this is a motto and not a hook drug. But just notice um, the use of color, right? With mottos, you are typically not covering your entire backing with stitches and color. You're leaving the backing, it's showing. You're just adding elements to it like text and a few pictures, not always. There's not always a picture and a motto, but this one has a house. And I think that's very relevant for us tonight, thinking about ways that we can use our house in compositions. At this moment, I don't have a house that I would use, you know, because the house that I grew up in that my heart is so attached to in Rhode Island uh, was like a 1970s house. It wasn't like a super charming house maybe i would use it it was dark brown right it was dark brown very 70s it wasn't like an exquisite looking house it was just obviously the memories that are attached to being there the house i live in now i could give or take um the house that my mom lives in now unfortunately is the house that you know they moved here and then my dad died soon after so it doesn't have great associations either sometimes you just get to a weird crossroads where um, you're not exactly in the place where your heart is right and that's a great chance it's a great opportunity to think back to other places where there might be other houses um, that you might want to think about using in compositions right just something to think about you don't have to um, write the idea off because your current house isn't your dream house or the house of your heart it's not your true or forever nest you could just use something else as a placeholder right 
thinking about this brought up um hold on i was just waxing i was waxing all lyrical for a minute so i thought um let me see if there's any more poems i can read to you really quick Oh, you know what? Let me give you this one. This is so cute. This book, you know, this book is just too much. It's in a lot of ways. But I really liked this because this poem by Elaine V. Emmons, E-M-A-N-S, is about a very specific thing about home, the fragrance of home. And this is something, right? Doesn't everybody say scent is the strongest of the senses? And I really believe that to be true. That is why I keep spraying myself with this jam donut spray that I got because it reminds me of Dunkin' Donuts, uh, which is very good associations always. But the fragrance of home for each of us, again, is gonna be very different, right? I've never, I've never been lucky enough to live in a home where you open the window and the scent of lilac comes in. I would, I was gonna say die for that, I wouldn't quite, but I would love that. I would love to fall asleep with the scent of lilac. It's only a week of the year, but nonetheless, I could, it, it, I could make it last, right, in my memory. You know, everybody has a different scent at home, and when you enter someone's house, assuming it, that it's fairly clean and you're not detecting horrible scents, they smell differently. And you can smell on people's clothes, like not just their laundry detergent, but their scent. All of these things mingle. So this poem I thought was so cute. It's called The Fragrance of Home, and it goes like this. There should be fragrance when a door to a home is opened, welcoming the ones who come, whether it be but sunlight on the floor and plants along the windowsill or some warm odor from the kitchen, baking bread or peanut butter cookies laid to cool, a steaming cocoa pot or toast that spread with cinnamon and sugar. After school or play, a child and after work, a man finds home a little lovelier, scented so. For always opening a door, they know someone is there before them and they can detect, besides the fragrances that greet them, warmth of real affection, doubly sweet. In other words, all of the things that the person is doing, whether it's cooking or cleaning or tidying or putting flowers out, whatever they're doing that's kicking up this, these unique scents, when people subsequently come, they come into the house and they feel that elusive thing that we call cozy, right? And you associate that with your home. And children have such struck. If you blindfolded a child and walked them into the wrong home, they would know they were in the wrong home because it doesn't have the same sense of their home, does it? I thought that was so nice to pick out that one little thing about home that made it so different. Wouldn't it be great to think about the sense of home, right, from years ago, particularly like when we were younger and we did more baking of cookies and stuff when we were growing up and more baking in general, more using chafing dishes and having neighbors over and having parties. And our house, I can still smell what that house smelled like. And my parents were always, she went in the other room, uh, were always painting. You know, they, they were always wanting to change things up. And um, I remember they painted the living room this great paprika color. It was so bold. And then the house smelled like paint for so long. And it really mingled with all of the cooking smells because we had parties so often. All of those things are right in my head, right at the front, it is Doreen, it's a cozy night. But I wonder if you could synthesize, it would take a lot of thought and planning, but like a, a, a rug, a composition that was like the house that you're thinking of, and then in the border, almost like a Thanksgiving sort of cornucopia thing, try to include all the scents that you associate with that house. That would be a real challenge, wouldn't it? That would be a real exercise, because I could picture like, bottle of wine for my parents with some grapes or something like that, a tray of cookies, maybe cookies for Santa and a bottle of milk for us kids. I mean, it would be, that would be an interesting composition. I'm going to think about that at four in the morning now. Shouldn't have said it. So lots of ideas to brainstorm, right? I'm just going to do one more little thing and then I'm going to save the rest of this episode for the second half for later in the week. So one of the rugs that I kept thinking about when I was doing this episode um, was Joan Moshimer's famous schoolhouse rug, and I could not find an image of it. And I was so irritated because when you go into, if you're lucky enough to live anywhere near Door Wool, right, New Hampshire, Newport, New Hampshire, as soon as you walk in, there's a nice, I don't know who hooked it, but there's a nice older rug, probably 1970s, 1980s, of Joan Moshimer's schoolhouses. And it looks just like the schoolhouses or the houses that you see in quilt designs. It looks just like this. But I think there's 16 of them in the one that I'm thinking of, the Joan Moshimer pattern. 
and it does not appear to be currently available. And if it were, it would be at Cushing, but I didn't immediately find it when I was looking today. But Joan Moshimer did a design that looked just like this. Um, and again, it was either 9 or 16. It was more. But it was so beautiful because, again, quilters who are watching, you know when you see a repeated subject like this, it's going to be a great composition. And it's going to give you endless opportunities for play, right? So this one is really different. This rug appeared on eBay, and it was one of these broken links. So I didn't know anything about it other than it was once on eBay. It's not anymore. It, they, they put up that thing. We searched everywhere. We searched everywhere for you, but we couldn't find what you're looking for. So all I could grab was this image. And I thought, that is beautiful, isn't it? This is a hook drug, not a quilt. And what a great idea. Because if you're a quilter, you know you cannot copyright or patent this design. This is an old design. Nobody owns this design. If you were to do it exactly the same way as Joan Mashaber, I would. I'm going to stick my neck out and say, it would still not be a copyrighted design. This is an old design. Nobody owns schoolhouses. This is this is one of these quilt patterns of yore that nobody owns it. And then you see versions of it like this too, which is essentially the same. And I do. This is one that I had on my phone. I do not know where I got it. But another. It's it's cut off. I feel like it must have been eBay or Etsy. But I feel um, like this is very similar. They've taken the chimney off. But again, we have got the repeat of a house. And again, we've got six. And it's different than this one. If you're thinking, well, that's the same design. It's not. It's not the same design. It's quite different. The door is in a different place. There's no chimney. But you see what I mean with these schoolhouse designs? Um, these are just old designs. You can use them, borrow them, beg, steal, and borrow. You can do it. Now, this one, now this is a bit different. And this is where, Catherine, I was going to look for your help because... I cut my caption off here, but you were tagged in this post, Catherine. So it looks like this was posted a while ago by possibly, is there somebody named Dawn Carson in your group, in the, at least in the Midwest group? I'm just wondering, because I don't know if Jennifer's on tonight too, but I saved this on my phone ages ago, and I wrote, um, I wrote to the person who posted this, it looks like it might be Dawn at the time, and I said, I just love what you did with this. Um, but I didn't, I didn't save it properly because it's cropped. Um, because the post said, I finished my worm challenge. So this must have been a 2020 post uh, rug after pulling a late nighter. She says, yay, I think I'll need a couple small tweaks, but it's complete. Whoop, whoop. And she tagged Catherine and one other person in it. And I just thought this is a phenomenal example of what we're talking about with the repeat rug, right? Isn't that gorgeous? This is this is even bigger than the Joan Moshimer. I think at the most Joan Moshimer was, uh, it was a different shape too. It was taller. The one at door is taller, but um, this is a great composition because look at the shading on the houses. Just the shading makes the houses actually look like they're different sizes and they're not. But what I like about this is the framing around each house and the sort of blocks in between at the junctures between all of the houses really good some of the houses they have these like light um, parts on them that look almost like a uh, pediment right like almost like greek greek architecture glued to the front of them i like there's a scrappy quality to some of them and there's a light dark shadow part to some of them i just think that this is an exceptional rug and i have a real aversion to celery green and sage green and yellow and i still have to say i love this rug this is when i love to be wrong when you look at something like this and you go you have to have that kind of yellowy sand color or it's not going to work, is it? This is perfect the way that it is. It's nice to be wrong. I love to be wrong. I said that at physical therapy today because I went in and I said, I thought I was going to be boobing around down on the floor with my stretchy pants on, super bored, panicking about how long this is taking. And I'm so happy that I'm wrong because I, it's actually feeling much better. Amazing magic. What, what kind of magic are they doing over at PT? So... I noticed also at the bottom of that rug that I just showed you, I'm not sure if Catherine's still there, Vermont Folk Rug. So it looks like a pattern by Vermont Folk Rugs. As soon as you start framing things out differently, copyright it becomes a thing again, right? Like not just stacking the houses you know, top to bottom in a quilt kind of haphazard way, but once you start framing them with borders that are a bit unique and you put your personal stamp on it, 
becomes copyrighted. So Vermont Folk Rugs, it looks like, again, I cut it off at the bottom, but um, you might want to check them out if you're looking for this particular design. It is beautiful. And what a thing. You know, I can see why she went with the yellow because this she's got a pretty consistent blue sky. And it whether you notice it at first glance or not, and I didn't, it's happy. It makes you happy to see that blue sky. And the yellow is the obvious complement to the blue right on the color wheel. So that worked out beautifully. And I had to show you this example. I'm getting to the end now before we break. This is another example of the same kind of repeated schoolhouse pattern. You know, you, you make a few tweaks to it and it's a schoolhouse or a house. This is a double chimney, but this is a latch hook example of essentially the same pattern. So take a look at that. And I wanna show this to you because I'm thinking, why shouldn't you do this kind of thing, right? Instead of having the house in every single block, now they have broken it up by alternating with these blocks that are split into fours with the pinwheel, right? So that's a bit tricky. But what if you did one pinwheel or one snowflake? Because these are obviously, this is like a winter rug, isn't it? This latch hook. It's got snowflakes in the border. You see those little dit dots of white and behind the houses? You could, I like what they've done with the red and green pinwheels, but it is quite busy and fussy. Um, this is certainly a pattern. I just don't know who, whose pattern it is. But, you know, you could easily alternate your houses or your schoolhouses with just straight up snowflakes or just a quilt pattern, just one. Forget about the four because that's hard to do with hooking, but just the one quilt pattern. And then you've got a completely different composition. You've multiplied your house. It's like a kaleidoscope, isn't it? All of the same house. And then in every other block, you've chosen to do something very different. I think that's a great idea. Now, this one I want to show you real quick. I'm, again, right at the end. I'm sorry my mouth runs for so long. Um, I cut this one off, too, and the part that I caught, it says, called Number 10 Pumpkin Lane by Wooly Woolens. So that's the important part, Wooly Woolens. Um, and this was on Facebook. And the reason I pulled this one, this was on my phone from, like, a year or two ago. Number 10 Pumpkin Lane by Wooly Woolens. You know... This is another example, just like the Betsy Ross house. This is another example of a house that might not be your house, but that's special to you. This looks like a Salem style, you know, Cape Ann house, North Shore, Boston, that has that very um, witchy sort of look to it, right? Salem, it's like the era of the witch hunts, you know, the, the 17th century houses, dark colors, this sort of shape, right? Salt box type shape. Um, you know, when you're doing a house rug, it doesn't have to be, this looks like the witch house, actually. It doesn't have to be your house. It can be anything like that. And then it reminded me that I have this beautiful rug that I bought a while ago on eBay. I haven't finished it yet. And I, to be honest, God knows when I'll finish it, but I love it. It's another one of these Salem houses, right? I hope to finish it soon. It's a good pattern by, let me see if I can, Pris Butler. Okay, well, that, no wonder it's great, right? But it has a beautiful house in it here. I thought I'd finish it last Halloween or the Halloween before, and I haven't because I've been too busy with ribbon candy hooking. But, you know, one of these days, that's another Salem house, right? And then there's a familiar down there, the black cat, the witch in the sky. But I'm just making the point that when you're looking to do a house rug, if it's not your house uh, where your heart is at this moment, think about houses that are important to you. Because when I saw this one, I immediately, immediately thought of one of my favorite houses, which is the House of the Seven Gables, also in Salem, Massachusetts, the house after the, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, cousin lived in it, and then he wrote the book called The House of the Seven Gables, and it looks very much like this, and like that one I just showed you. Very atmospheric, historic house. What a great subject for a rug, right? It has all of those strong associations, the book, the mystery, the writer, that time, Salem itself. Um, there must be a place in your town beautiful old house that has those strong associations to your heart too, right? Something else to think about, diamond window panes. That's it, Patricia, isn't it? Th those kinds of details are the things that give you the clues, bring you to another place in time. That's exactly it. Those details, I didn't even think of that. You're good. And the last thing I want to show you tonight, I think, are these two rugs. And then we're going to continue this episode um, later. Yeah, we're going to continue it later in the week um, because I wanted to do half of the episode and I've, I've had too much content, which is still impossible for me to judge. 
um, half of the episode was specifically about rugs with storybook cottages. There's a lot of these. It's not just Cushing who puts these out. There have historically been lots of storybook cottages on hook drugs. So let's do that later in the week because that is its own beast. So I want to end on this note. You know I always have to put Claire Mare into our episodes because she's a great idol of mine. But I just want to show you a couple of her very famous house rugs. Does um, she, you know, when she left Manhattan and she moved to uh, Nantucket and her neighbor was a rug hooker and she learned how to hook with yarn and she's never used a frame, right? She's always hooked right on her lap. But, um, you know, she, she was doing very quaint subjects that she saw around her like the classic Nantucket cottage. And they always look like this. So first let me show you this. This is one of the sort of montages. And you know what I love about this is it's showing you that this is the half cape, right? We've seen a lot of Cape Cod houses. If this was a full cape, the door would be in the middle and there'd be two more windows on the other side. This is the half cape. This is for like bachelor sailors back in the day, that half cape. That's a super rare one to find in real life. It's very rare to see a half cape. Sometimes you see the three quarter cape. This is a, this is a little um, um, uh, architecture for dummies segment, but it, not that I think any of you are dummies, of course, but when you see the cape with the two windows on one side and one on the other, that's the three quarter cape. So you have the full cape, which is like the double, it has two and two, or the half cape or the three quarter. And these are the distinctions. So I just love that she hooked a half because they are very, very rare. And then just different styles of architecture. Um, this is this would be considered a full cape because it's balanced, but it does it's not the same size as if it had two windows on both sides, right? Still so neat. And then these grand houses. This looks like the series of three houses that are like the same guy built all three for his kids right next to each other on Nantucket. I think the guy who had the windmill. I forgot about all that history. Here's another half cape right here in the center. She likes her half capes. I'm, I'm guessing looking at this piece that these are actually houses on Nantucket. How many times a day do I think it's time to go back to Nantucket and rent a bike and just cruise around and check out the architecture? And then I'll end on this little one. This is kind of like, it, not exactly a repeat of her one there, but it's a little bit um, nostalgic of sort of this one here, but it's this. And this is probably, I would say, in her top five most famous designs, Home Sweet Home. It's doctored up a bit. It's got kind of that arbor around the door. But look at all the bleeding hearts and all the flowers around the edge and her checkerboard. Look at this great checkerboard um, pre Mackenzie Childs, right? This is just all Claire Murray. And the fact that she created that kind of arc over the chimney that dips in is so, it looks like a heart, doesn't it? Home is where the heart is. Patricia says, Cape with center chimney is classic. Oh, it so is, isn't it? And the little fence outside, the little white picket fence. Now this is like a picture within a border within a border. Great use of space because look at the size of the house in comparison to the entire composition. The house is really small. If you were to put that house right in the center of that composition, wouldn't you say to yourself, well, what else am I going to do now? How am I going to fill the rest of the space up? Well, that's how you do it. You do these crazy things like you put in this almost like medieval illumination, right, with a dip in it. You do something like this, Widow's Peak right here, and you already have an interesting composition. Would it be as interesting if it was just an arc or an archway? No! The Widow's Peak looks fantastic. It's a great vehicle for those bleeding hearts. And then she's got the flowers, right, that may or may not be in the house. Who cares if they are, right? Because they look gorgeous in the piece, like um, sort of overflowing onto the sky, right? So they're sort of bleeding. The bleeding hearts are bleeding onto the composition. And then she got all geometric and strict and prim and boxed it out with all the checkerboard. And it just, the contrast is phenomenal. But you know that checkerboard is really picking up the slats in the fence, the slats on the door, the slats on the uh, shutters, and the roof, right? All those little tile, roof tiles. It's picking up on all those things. She was, she is not a dummy. She is so good. That, that mixture of fluid versus geometric, just do it. Force those geometric lines in there. It's patterning. It's just more patterning. Keep your flowers fluid. It sounds like one of my poems, right? Keep your flowers fluid. But get the geometrics in there. That's a great composition tip, particularly with designy stuff like hook drugs. Keep your, um, keep your geometrics in there. You will find that they give structure. 
uh, to whatever piece you're working on. Now let's end on a nice poem here. That is gorgeous, isn't it, Gail? Kate would say, Debbie, also thinking of hooking a house and one of my fave children's books, The Little House. Oh, absolutely. That is a great idea because that is, you know, for people who read that whole Little House series, that is just, um, it, it's locked in your heart forever, isn't it? And just like me with my jo Judy Bolton books and my Nancy Drews, um, actually hooking one of those houses might be a good idea for me. The Case of the Leaning Chimney or something like that. Um, same idea. It like it's right in your it's locked in your heart and you just know you're gonna love the way it comes out because you love the subject so much. That's the thing about house rugs. The person who hooked them loved the subject so much that you feel it still when you see it. You don't know the house, you don't know where it is, but you feel it. You feel the love for the subject. And you don't get that with every rug. Right? You don't get that because the connection of the maker to the subject isn't always there. But with house rugs, you can assume that it is there. With, I think very few exceptions, right? Maybe if Jane Eyre or uh, Mr. Rochester's uh, crazy wife who lived in the, in the attic and started a fire, if she were to hook that house, maybe not such love for the house. But most of us who don't you know, commit arson probably have a very strong affection for the house that is the subject of their piece. Um, that was a wacky tangent. Sorry about that. So these books are just, they're just, uh, they're just too much. They have little quotes in them too. They have scrapbooks on some of these pages. They're very religious, but I still, whether you are religious or not, recommend them because they say things like for the own, for, for the only happy toilers under earth's majestic dome are the ones who find their glories in that little spot called home put that around the border of a rug, right? So maybe I'll leave it at that tonight. I had, I have so many poems in here, but we are just running far too late. Okay, one more. Let's do this one. We'll end on this one, this poem called Kitchen Window by Mildred Pearl Van Horn. And this is about, um, this is about sight, right? The last one was about fragrance. So this is about the view, the sight from the kitchen window, and it goes like this. I see beauty from my window in the clear blue morning sky. The freshly whipped cream moving clouds daily catch my eye. When tender greens of springtime stand tiptoe on my lawn, I wait to watch the early sun paint a rosebud dawn. When summer days lay shadows across my welcome mat, I catch the calm serenity shrouding dog and cat. While, re while red gold days of autumn sow their varied seams, I stand above my steaming stove, weaving gypsy dreams. And when my winter world is hushed, my backyard piled with snow, the window blends with quietness and with the peace I know. That is so nice, isn't it? I hadn't read that one through. Brings you right through all the seasons, doesn't it? Oh, I just love it. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. It was one that I have been thinking about for a while, just br bringing to your attention the possibility uh, of hooking a rug with the composition of a house in it. But more importantly, um, you know, next time you are out and about and you see a rug with a house, being a bit mindful and thoughtful about, number one, is it a commercial composition or is it obviously not? And if it's not, are you looking at it like a portrait and saying, I just can't relate to it. I don't know where this house is or who it belonged to. Think about it more in terms of somebody loved this house and their life was inside of it. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's worth a rug. And you know, it just, I'm probably gonna, um, with this one episode up the market price of, of house rugs and make it impossible for myself to acquire anymore. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about because there are so many subjects when it comes to rug hooking um, but this is one that is common and I think it is, is overlooked. So something to think about, something to dream on, um, something to sketch over, right? All of these things. If it, if it strikes you as a subject that you might be interested in, I want to return to it again. I want to look at the Atha uh, magazine on Monday in Coffee Time at noon Eastern Standard Time, same channel, Ribbon Candy Hooking. 
and um, and then let's move later in the week, probably on Tuesday. Let's look. Let's finish our chapter on on the home in the hook drug, and let's look at specifically storybook cottages. That is the era of the 1920s and 30s with that very fantasy faux European house that we refer to in architectural terms as a storybook cottage. Really, a made-up style. Um, that didn't come from Europe at all, but um, from imagination and from Hollywood. So we'll talk about how that style sort of took root, and we'll look at a ton of rugs that are hooked in the storybook style, because those you will find everywhere. Uh, many of those are commercial patterns, so we'll talk about which ones are. So if you are thinking about collecting that particular genre, that little fold in collecting the storybook hooked rug, um, you want to know whether you're picking up a commercial pattern or not. So we'll talk about that too. So I hope you have a great weekend, everybody. I hope you got some good ideas. We're going to have a good weekend here. It has poured rain on us, but now I feel like a new woman with my, my shoulder sort of working, or was it the four aspirin? Hard to say. Uh, we'll probably go out with the kids tomorrow and do some stuff outside, um, enjoy this beautiful weather, and maybe go to the pumpkin patch or something like that. But I will really look forward to seeing you on Monday. Uh, for coffee time at noon. So have a great time until then. Remember to check out Jocelyn's birthday rugs on ribboncandyhooking.com. Her birthday is coming up fast. It's on Thursday and she still is determined on her birthday to come on live and show you how to uh, twist a dog balloon, like make a balloon out of a dog. She can't do it in the morning because I have to bring her to school. Um, it's not a ditch day for us because we have too many ditch days coming up. It's not it's not worth it But I'll probably do a weird impromptu live episode even possibly on Facebook later in the day Where I bring her on for her birthday and she makes her balloon dog for all of you I know you're dying for that balloon dog and I think on that day too I will probably release my balloon dog pattern, which I never I never hooked I never got to I'll probably release that as a, I will release that as a free pattern on Thursday for her birthday to celebrate. So be looking out for a balloon dog hooked rug pattern, very specific, to celebrate Jocelyn's birthday. And look at Jocelyn's patterns in her kits. She works very hard on color planning those kits. She does all of them. I oversee, but she does all of them. And she's so proud um, when we send anything out that's, that people buy and she gets, she gets the money for it. I said I would take the supply part of it and give her the difference, but you know I don't. I just can't. She's too excited when she makes her sales. She's like Ebenezer Scrooge and, and Marley put together. But I hope that you have a great weekend, everybody. Carol, I hope you're feeling well. I'll send you a message this weekend. Um, take care, and I will see you Monday. I hope it's a very long weekend. I hope it feels like it lasts forever. I'll see you on Monday. Hmm.